Well, good evening. It's good to be with you this evening. For the next few Sunday evenings, Jason and I want to put together a short series of videos, kind of like a video study for you, kind of supplement our Sunday evenings. Uh, one of the comments we've received recently is that after Sunday morning, there seems to be a long gap and people are kind of hungry for more information, more fellowship, more learning, and to kind of get us back in this avenue and the groove once again of assembling on Sunday evenings, we want to provide these uh, studies with you that will kind of encourage you and help you as we kind of go on. We have a lot of material that, that will help you every day. We have our podcasts, we have our jump starts, our daily Bible readings, and our Sunday class videos, lots of things that will help you, but we just want to give you another layer, uh, more information, more help that will help you go in this way. And so for this series, what we want to talk about, we want to look at Bible words, Bible words that you should know. And so we encourage you to get your Bible, pull up in an easy chair like I'm in right now, maybe get a pen and some paper, and let's just engage in a few moments of study of God's Word. When we begin in the book of Ephesians in chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul would remind us of the value of the words of God. He would say, beginning in verse 3, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. I wrote, you read. And, and, and it's that combination of the Word of God that makes us so important to us. God had a lot of ways he could have communicated with us. He could communicate with pictures. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. He could have communicated through feelings. And, and a lot of people, that's where they think God did communicate. And I feel this way and I feel that way. But the problem with feelings is everyone's feelings are different. Uh, you and I can go to an art gallery and we can look at a picture of modern art. And you can say, I, I, I see the, the artist's pain. I see what he's trying to express there. I may look at it and say, well, it's a mess. What, what's he trying to do there? And so feelings are subjective. They, they, they change with each person. So God used the avenue of words. And words are definite. And words can be defined. And words can be memorized. And words can be translated. And words have, can be copied. And words have specific meanings. So when it comes to the Ten Commandments, it was the finger of God that wrote words. God told his apostles, go into all the world and preach. They were to preach words to the audiences. And so with that concept and with that understanding, Jason and I want to spend a few Sunday evenings talking to you about Bible words. Bible words that you should know. Now, under that umbrella of Bible words, there's, there's really several categories we can talk about. We can talk about the words involving discipleship. We can talk about words involving the church. And to kick this series off, what we want to talk about are the words of salvation. Lots of words fall under that category. Words such as atonement, words such as justification, redemption, even our word baptism are some words that you and I need to understand the meaning and kind of get an explanation of what these words are all about. But, but the word we want to look at today in our first study is we want to talk about the word gospel. And to kind of chase that word down, to kind of look at it, and to understand some things along that line. There will be some PowerPoints coming up here and there that will kind of help you with that. The word gospel is only found in the New Testament, and it's found 97 times. It comes from a Greek word that looks very similar to our word evangelist. You, you see similar comparisons to those words there. The word gospel really means literally good tidings. Or we've kind of shaped it to simply the understanding and the definition of good news. The gospel is good news. We look at our Bible now. Let's, let's just look at some passages. In Luke chapter 2, that's the very words that the angel used here when they were talking to the shepherds. Luke chapter 2 and in verse 10, the Bible says, The angel said to them, to the shepherds, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. I bring you good news. The gospel means good news. 
And it's the gospel that we find is part of the Christian armor. Remember in Ephesians chapter 6 when he talks about putting on the breastplate and the helmet and all these articles of warfare and, and, and armor, we would say. He says in verse 15, and having shod your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace. And then in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 3, and in verse 6, the gospel is that bridge that linked the Jews and the Gentiles. A lot of differences between Jews and Gentiles. But it was the gospel that would be that bridge that they could travel over together. To be specific, he says in Ephesians 3, verse 6, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. How did they become fellows? How did they become united? How did they become linked? It was that bridge of the gospel that they went over. Now, let's talk about this word gospel. There are really three different layers of meanings for the gospel. The first one, and the most limited way, is to refer to the first four books of the New Testament. In my Bible here, in the book of Matthew, it says the gospel according to Matthew. The gospel. And so, when we think about the word gospel, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The story of Jesus. That is one way the word gospel is used. It's a very limited way. Now, a second way the word gospel is used is to refer to the totality of the New Testament, the New Testament message, we might say. And so it's, it's beyond the scope of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It covers the message of Jesus. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, I think this is the, the idea we get here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. Paul would, would use it in this way here. He says in this way, he says, Having thus a, a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Paul imparted the gospel to them. This letter was considered a gospel to them. It was a part of the New Testament message. Now, what you find in 1 Thessalonians, just a couple pages later, in chapter 4, and verse 13, he talks about this coming of Jesus. He talks about the resurrection of the righteous and how the righteous will be with Jesus. That's part of this gospel message. And then when you get to the fifth chapter and you get in that long section of just simple bullet points about discipleship, he would say, for instance, we urge you, brethren, verse 14, to admonish the unruly, encourage the fainthearted, help the weak, be patient with all men, see to it that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek after what is good for one another and for all men. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, that's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but that's part of the gospel message. That's part of the truth of Jesus. And so that's, that's part of how this word is used. Now, Another word that would be very similar to this is the word faith. The word faith can, can be used multiple ways. It can talk about our faith, what I believe. It can talk about the New Testament or the gospel message. In the book of Ephesians, there's one Lord, one God, one, one body. There is one baptism. There is one faith. What is that faith? Well, that's the New Testament message here. Jude said in Jude verse 3, contend earnestly for the faith. The faith, the gospel, are very similar. They're linked together in that way. Now, over here in the book of 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we find in verse 8, as he talks about the coming of Jesus in verse 7, that he'll come to relieve those who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The gospel is something to be obeyed. So it's more than just a message. It's more than just the story of Jesus. 
It's a truth that we are to believe and we are to obey. And here in Thessalonians, those who do not obey that message, those who do not obey that gospel, they'll receive the punishment coming from Jesus. So what is the word gospel? It means the story of Jesus, the limited way. It refers to the entire New Testament. And then in the third way it's used is referred to what was preached. What was preached was the gospel. Now, let's go to the book of Acts. And predominantly, this is how the word gospel is used in the book of Acts, to refer to what was preached. Acts chapter 8, now, let's look at verse 25. Acts chapter 8 and verse 25, as it talks about the messengers uh, preaching. And it says, And so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages in Samaria. They were preaching the gospel. Same chapter, if you will, verse 40. But Philip found himself as Estos, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. He was preaching the gospel. Chapter 14 of the book of Acts, and this this is just found all over the book of Acts, but in chapter 14 and in verse 7. And there they continued to preach the gospel. And then again, and one other example of this is in the book of 1 Corinthians now, 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, notice how the word gospel came up. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel of which I preach to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by that which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And so the according to the Scriptures is similar, or we would say synonymous, with preaching the gospel. They preached the gospel, which meant they preached the scriptures of God's word. Now, another time this word is used, and a very important place, is found in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. The gospel. Romans 1, verse 16. There it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, it is the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel, or for it, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So the gospel, the message of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the New Testament system, we might say, it is the avenue from which God saves us. It is the power of of salvation. And as we end this, we're going to come back to this and talk about that in just a minute. But we need to see that that is the avenue. That is the power. God saves us through the gospel. We reach God through the gospel. Through the gospel, we learn about Jesus. Through the gospel, we learn what God wants us to do to be saved. Through the gospel, our faith is built and grows and stands strong because of what the gospel message is used. That's that concept. Now, you and I also use the word gospel in a couple ways. We don't necessarily find specifically in the Bible. The principles, I think, are there, but they're not found specifically. One, one way we use this word is to talk about preachers. We say he is a gospel preacher. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is he preaches the New Testament. He preaches faithfully. He is true to God's message. He is a gospel preacher as opposed to a false teacher. He teaches what is true as opposed to what is false. And so in that way, we use the word gospel preacher. All preachers ought to be gospel preachers, but a whole bunch of them are not. Second way we use this word is to talk about gospel meetings. Will you come to our gospel meeting, we say. And in that format, we invite a preacher from afar to come in and he presents some sermons or Bible lessons, and it is a gathering, a meeting, in which the focus is upon 
the preaching of the gospel, a gospel meeting. Now, now we, we have said this before, and, and you know when we're talking to our neighbors and our coworkers, and we use that word gospel meeting, you and I understand that concept. Oftentimes, they do not. You know, they, they have meetings at work, and those meetings are long and boring. And so come to my gospel meeting, that doesn't sound very inviting to them. It might be better to say, let's come and hear some Bible lessons. Let's hear the Bible preached. That might be more understandable and presentable than using that phrase, gospel meeting. So two words come out of this idea of the word gospel. Good news and power to salvation. Good news and power. Let's talk about those two words for a moment. What's good? What was the good news? Well, the good news was that a Savior had come into the world. That's what the angels told the shepherds. And the Savior has come. Good news is that God has given you and I a second chance. He could have said you have one chance in this life and you blew it and that's it. You're on your own. But the good news is through Jesus we have forgiveness. The good news is through Jesus we have the hope of heaven. The good news is that the cost of salvation has been paid. Whenever there's sin, somebody has to pay the penalty. A price has to be paid. And that price was the blood of Jesus. And that way, it's good news. I want to go with you to two places in the book of Proverbs. Uh, they, they do not use the word gospel, but they use the word good news. And they use it in a very special way. Proverbs 15, Proverbs 15, and look at verse 30. Bright eyes gladden the heart. Good news put fat on the bones. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Good news. We like hearing good news. We, we, we like to hear about engagements and weddings and babies being born. We like to hear about baptisms, and we like to hear about people being appointed to the, being elders or shepherds. We like good news. We, we, we like when things are going well, and it puts fat on the bones. It, it's, a, it's a healthy concept. And then in Proverbs 25, just another example of this, Proverbs 25 and verse 25 like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a distant land. And, and you can imagine a, a, after you've worked out in your yard and, and you're, it's a hot day and you're really thirsty, how refreshing cold water is. How refreshing good news is. The gospel is good news. Now, how we present it sometimes can make, make it look like it's bad news. And sometimes we talk more about hell than heaven. And sometimes we make it so difficult that people think, well, th this doesn't sound like it's good at all. But it is good news. It needs to be presented in a positive, optimistic, uplifting way because it's heaven's reaching out to us. It's God saying, I haven't given up on you. It's God saying, I want you in heaven. But now the second word is power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Now, what way is it power? Let, let's throw a couple other verses here, if you will, on this. In John chapter 8, again, not using the word gospel, but using that understanding, that concept. John 8 and verse 31, 32, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is a key. The truth, or the gospel, is power. Power to change our lives. You take a guy out here, and he's been dishonest. Through the gospel, through walking with Jesus, he can become an honest person. You take a guy out there, and he's just been an old grump all his life, complaining and negative and just, just a downer all his life. Through Jesus, through the gospel, through following and walking with the Lord, he can become a gentle, kind, generous person. You take somebody and, and, and maybe they've been selfish. Through the gospel, they become a giver. They become a servant of others. They help others. The gospel is the power to change us. And that's what we need to see. We, we, we have little expressions like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That might be true of dogs. I don't know. But of people, that's not true. Because you put in the gospel, 
and, and, and the person's willingness to do what the gospel says, and he can change. It is the power unto salvation. Secondly, it is the power to wash away our sins. No matter what we've done, no matter how many times we've done it, God can forgive us. God can forgive an adulterer like David. God can, can forgive someone who got drunk like Noah. God can forgive somebody who got real angry like Noah, or excuse me, like Moses. God, God can, can forgive a Peter who denied the Lord three times. God can forgive Paul who killed early Christians. God can forgive all of us. It is the power to do that. It is the power to drive out fear, doubt, and worry. And boy, those three cousins right there like to live in our block, don't they? Fear, worry, and doubt. We're afraid of the future. We're afraid of what's going on in our country. We're fearful. We're doubting. And what the gospel can do, it, can, it is the power to change that. It's the power to drive that out. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know God's on the throne. I don't know what the answer is, but I can pray to my God. The gospel teaches you that. It is the power to drive those things away from you. And it is the power to overcome temptation and Satan himself. When Jesus was tempted, he referred to the word of God. That was the solution. He didn't pull out a miracle. He didn't call an angel from heaven down. But he referred to the same thing you have, and that's the Bible. And God's word, God's truth is strong enough to do these things. It's strong enough to quench every missile of the evil one, as the book of Ephesians teaches us. It is, is the power to overcome temptation, that there is a better way. God providing the way of escape can help us through these things. Simple word, gospel, how powerful that is. Let's end with one other verse that actually uses this word. It's from the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Go into all the world, he told the apostles, and preach the gospel to all creation. Everybody deserves the gospel. Everybody needs the gospel. And God wants every person to hear that gospel. That means every continent. That means every country. That means every city. That means every street. That means every house. That means every person in that house. That's our task. Our task is to get that message out. And our task is to realize that we cannot discriminate. We can't say, oh, this would make a great member. Oh, that guy would be a terrible member. We can't be doing that. We got to realize that God wants that gospel to every person. It's changed your life. It's changed my life. What a great word that is. The first word when we come to salvation is the word gospel. I hope that's been helpful for you. And I hope it gives you some things to think about. And I hope through this little series we're doing here, it will help our faith grow as we think about our walk with God. Thank you so much.